Good morning, church. If you're visiting with us today, welcome. Those kids are going back to our Bible school, Children Bible School Hour that we call Imagination Station, um, where they're going to hear the truth of Jesus and uh, um, learn from God's Word and share a good time together. And so if your uh, child is between the ages of uh, three through a uh, three-year-old to fourth grade, um, they're more than welcome to go back there. And uh, um, sometimes uh, older kids can go um, help to be a blessing for that too. So if you're interested in that, please just come and talk to me. And uh, it's such a blessing that we as a church get to uh, share the truth of Jesus to all generations together in the way that we do, to be able to share that truth. For those of you that helped Jimmy out with singing the fruit of the Spirit, thank you for that. Because um, that's such a good song to be able to remember what the fruit of the Spirit is. And that's what we're going to be doing for the next couple of weeks is looking at the fruit of the Spirit and witnessing the truth that if we're going to shine the light of Jesus, if we're going to do what Jesus called us out to do, we need to be full of the Spirit and trust in the truth of the Spirit. But I must start with this first. God is good. All the time. And all the time. Amen. As Tom brought up earlier, we were kind of tested with that in Laredo because, man, it was hot. And it, it was a difficult work that we did, but God was still good all the time. And we uh, were able to accomplish a lot and do a lot of really good ministry, and it is good to be back home. I know the group that went to Belize as well did a lot of really good work. Um, it was humid out there and hot down there as well. And uh, they were able to share the truth of Jesus to people in a really, really wonderful way with the medical mission work that they do down there. So I praise God that you're all able to get back home safely, all right? And it's good to be back together with you all. The group that went to Laredo was able to worship together with you. We live streamed along with you. So if you're live streaming right now, I'm thankful for live streaming. It worked out really well for us. We were able to be a part of uh, the worship service that went. We were able to be in spirit with the church here to be one family, even though distance may have separated us, the spirit brings us together. That's why the fruit of the spirit is so essential. Zach's sermon last week focused on John chapter 8 verse 12, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me does not walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. And in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, this is what we've been dealing with this whole entire year, is the truth that we are called to recognize the light and have fellowship in the truth together. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither does somebody light a light inside the house on a lamp and then cover that thing up. No, you leave it exposed so that people may see the good works of God and glorify him. And so we must look at the fruit of the Spirit as God's people, as being, um, well, we can look at it as being a sign in our lives that we're, we're shining God's light. But on the same end, as we've looked at in our adult Bible class today, we can also look at it as a sign of the hope that we have of gaining more and more understanding of how good our God is. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Ray blessed us um, on one of uh, our shepherd's prayers a couple of weeks ago by reading this passage of scripture. And it starts in verse number 16. Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, reminding them that the ways of the world are distracting. They will lead you towards sin and brokenness and corruption. But the ways of God will lead you to righteousness and goodness. And he points out to them a couple of ways you can know if you're being distracted and living by the world, or ways that you can know that you're living by the way of God and living in righteousness. And he says this, but I say, walk by the spirit. I'm in verse 16, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, those who follow me, those who believe in me will not walk in darkness, this is the darkness Jesus was talking about. This is the stuff that, that we need to not have in our lives to be able to walk in the light of life, to be able to trust him and follow him. Because Jesus was without sin. He was without any of these things. And he lived a righteous and pure life that was perfect for us. But Paul continues to go on. He doesn't stop there, as he's seemingly does in other places like the beginning of book of Romans if you don't continue to read on the whole rest of it. 
and he gives us the good news. He gives us the news of how we can know that we're walking in the light of life and that we're living the right lives and following Jesus. And he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, or sorry, love, joy, peace, I got it right, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and his desires. So John, this is Paul writing here in Ephesians. John in 1 John, turn there with me, chapter 2, tells us that we can know that we are saved. Bill, I'm kind of with you. When I took communion when I was young, there are many times I took communion. And I wondered if I was, like, as a teenager, I knew some of the things that I had done. I, I wondered if I was worthy to be able to take that. There were some times that I took communion, I took it with a broken heart, with going, I'm not good enough to be able to take this. John tells us here in 1 John, I wish I had known this when I was younger. John tells us in 1 John how beautiful the light of the Lord is, that God is love, and lets us know that we know that we're saved. We know that we're following Jesus, and it shows up in our lives this way. He says this in verse number 7. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So remember that whole list of things that Paul said at the end of uh, Galatians there? So that you don't do those things. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So I hope you all heard that, because what John is saying is what we all need to hear. There's nobody that, that is getting away with not needing to hear this. He says, I'm writing to you so that you don't sin, but when you do sin, which you're going to do until Jesus comes again, you're forgiven. You have an advocate from the Father because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whomever believes in him, whoever follows him, will not perish but have eternal life. And God didn't send his son to condemn the world but to save the world through him. So John says, here's how you can know that you're saved. Here's how you can know you have life. You follow Jesus. You let him be your advocate. He continues on and says this, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole entire world. He died for every single sin that's ever been committed and ever will be committed. The writer of Hebrews says that powerfully and profoundly in Hebrews chapter 10. I encourage you to read Hebrews 10, 1 through 25 later on today. I think you'll be hugely blessed from that. He died for the sins of the whole entire world and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Well, I don't know about you, but if I go back to the Jewish ways of things, they had 613 commandments to be able to keep the, the Decalogue, the 10 wise sayings, the 10 commandments of God. They came up with 613 things and they made it quite confusing. But when Jesus was here on earth, a lawyer, a teacher of the law came to him and said, Lord, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, well, what's the greatest commandments? And the guy said this, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your strength and all your mind. And Jesus says, well said. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So here's what John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way in which we are called, in the same way as Jesus walked. I really like how this version says it. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And then he says, you are the light of the world. And so the question is, how do we do that? How do we avoid the sins of the world, the distractions of the world, and live in the Spirit of God? I want you to turn with me to a really weird story about that. Because one of the things that Paul said in Galatians is that if you live by the fruit of the Spirit, the, there is no law against that, no law against you. Genesis is a book. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis is a book that is full of stories of people of God before 
the law was given, before the law of Moses came to them. And there's a story here that shows up in Genesis chapter 37 that I've always found quite, I'm glad I'm not Joseph. <laughs> I, I have no other words. I can't even tell you how I feel about that. Because if I was Joseph, I would have the hardest life ever and wonder what God is doing, where God is, and all of that, and go, all right, God, you say that you're love, but what in the world is going on here? What is my life all about? Let me give you some background story real quickly. Jacob had a brother named Esau. They were born as twins, and from the get-go, God favored Jacob. He told Jacob that he was, or actually told his dad Isaac and um, his mom that he was going to be the favored one, and that things are going to go well with him, and he's going to receive the birthright promises of God. But then Jacob and Esau have these weird stories where he ends up getting the birthright because Esau's really hungry and he feeds him some stew. And Esau's like, yeah, sure, I'll sell that. And then they have enmity and strife and jealousy as a result of that. By the way, doesn't that sound like lack of love? Like what sometimes we would consider the uh, opposite of love? Like there's this hatred that goes on between them. And then later on when his dad's ready to bless Esau because Esau is the firstborn, he's the one that should be getting it, Jacob and his mom set up a scheme. And he goes to his dad, and he looks and sounds, or let me rephrase this. He smells and feels like and gives food like Esau does, but his dad's blind at the time. So he doesn't see the truth that it's Jacob and not Esau. And he gives, Isaac gives Jacob the blessing. I still think Jacob, or Isaac's in on it, by the way. I, I, he asked so many times, you sound like Jacob, but, and you feel like he's, are you really who you're saying you are? I think he's in on it. But because of that, he fears that his brother no longer loves him. And he flees and goes and gets married. And when he gets married, another bad story ends up showing up because, again, the, the, the law of God wasn't there to help guide them. And there was a lot of weirdness that went on in these stories. And when he gets married, he finds out that his uh, father-in-law had messed things up for him. And he wasn't actually marrying the sister because there was two sisters of the one that he loved. And so he marries Leah first, and then ends up getting Rachel a little bit later on. Rachel has a hard time having children. And finally, she has a son, and they name him Joseph. And then she's able to have a second son finally, and they name him Ben Oni. And um, after she dies and having a lot of struggle with the childbirth and everything, he renames him to Benjamin. But Joseph becomes this younger child of all these 10 other guys, all these 10 other brothers, and ends up living. And we find out that because his dad loved his mom better than the other moms of, the other, of his other brothers, that Joseph ends up getting a hard rap, that he ends up having a hard life as a result of it. And his dad doesn't make it any better. Here in verse, I think it's like number three or something like that. We find out that his dad gives him this multicolored robe because he loves him so much and doesn't give the other brother stuff. And so his dad shows favoritism to him. And so we get to read this verse in verse number four, which says, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And in the very next verse we read, it says, verse 5, Now Joseph had a dream, and when he had told his brothers, they hated him even more. And we find out this dream is about how he, how, um, he was looking at this field, and he and his brothers were represented by these bundles of hay that were there in the field. All the bundles of hay bowed down to one bundle of hay, and guess who the one bundle of hay is? It's Joseph. And so we read down a couple of verses later that his brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he has another dream about sun, moon, and stars and about how all of them bowed down to the, to the one. And they hate him even more as a result of that. And their love keeps getting pushed aside further and further and further to the point that they can't even be family anymore. It was wisely said in this morning's Bible class as we were talking that the opposite of love is apathy. It's not wanting to have relationship anymore at all. Because what we see in Scripture, even though we don't fully understand it, is that a lot of times because of love, there can be some pretty strong heated emotions as a result of that. God has that. We don't fully understand it, and nor do I encourage us to go and say, hey, God did this. It's completely for us to have vengeance and all that stuff, because Paul does say in Romans that vengeance belongs to the Lord. 
So we need to be careful with that kind of stuff. But what we noticed and what Bill was saying up here when he was doing the communion talk is that there are aspects of God and aspects of lives that we just have to trust God in because even though we have a small understanding of stuff, we don't have a full understanding. And love is one of those keys in our life that we must live by the fruit of the Spirit instead of the fruit of what we think it is and what it should be. Because I promise you this, if we all, I would guess there's 250 some out of us in here, if we all sat down and tried to define love, there would be 250 different definitions of what love is here in this room. But God's definition is the one we need. Joseph's brothers get so upset at him. They hate him so much at this time because his father likes him better because he's getting dreams from God that makes him seem better than all of them, that his brothers, while they're out, decide to capture him, throw him in a pit, and do away with him. They are actually downright going to murder him and kill him. They're so angry at who he is and what is going on there and the fact that he's been saying these things, acting better than them, and it doesn't seem like he loves them. I'm sure they felt the same way inversely as they were really struggling with their love for him, that they decide to get rid of him. And Reuben, the firstborn, the one that deserves the birthright, the one that probably deserved the multicolored robe, right? Speaks up and says, should we really kill him? That this is wrong. We shouldn't be, he's our brother. And he's the only one that speaks up with actual love instead of apathy and tries to save him. Well, Reuben goes off trying to scheme to try to figure out things and how to save him. Then some slave traders come through the area and they end up selling Joseph to these traders and he goes off to Egypt, and they frame it as if they, they end up killing an animal and putting the blood on the coat, on, on his coat, the multicolored robe, and show it to the dad, and they try to say, your son is no more. But we find in the midst of the story that Reuben is brokenhearted because he wasn't able to save his brother from his other brothers. You continue on the story on Joseph, and I invite you to read this later on. It's just keep following the chapters after this in Genesis. Joseph's life, like, he, he loves the Lord. He trusts God in everything, but yet he keeps getting put in these bad situations that end him in jail, end him in prison, where he ends up hearing dreams and interpreting them, and he ends up getting put back up, on, up in a place. He ends up going low from a pit and possibly getting killed from his brothers, to be in high in the household of Potiphar, to go in low in jail again, to go in high in the whole place of Egypt, till his brothers end up getting saved because Joseph continues in his love for the Lord and trusts the Lord continuously, even though it doesn't make sense. There are seven years of good food and there are seven years of famine. And Joseph trusts the Lord and it ends up saving not only the people of Egypt, but his family as well when they come seeking for food. And he loves them. And he connects with them and engages with them and does not show them apathy. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me does not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And Jesus also said, you are the light of the world. What are you supposed to do about that? Because in 1 John, we found out that we find that God is light, and we also get to read in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. Well, John tells us, here's how you know that you're saved. Here's how you know that you are love and that you're living. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, Peter says, You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all of your heart, for you have been born again, but not of life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. I was messing with Jimmy when I came up here because that song we sang, I didn't realize what the chorus says at the end of it, that we'll, we'll see his glory or the, the glory won't change until we shall see his face. Like, one way you can look at that and read that is kind of how some people look at the word love today. You could read that and go, oh, we're, we're not going to get to see the fullness of his glory when we see it. It's going to change. It's going to be gone. Because our definitions are not God's definition of what truth is. We are only able to grasp a small measure of what it is. What God tells us in Scripture, full
in the midst of your differences, even in the midst of um, your definition differences on different things and what you should be doing. When you work together and you're putting up roofs and trusses and you have a disagreement on something, but yet you're still able to keep relationship, that's life. Whenever your brother is acting like he's the highest in everything and the dream, dreams he's sharing and everything, but yet you continue to seek out the best interest for him and engage with him as Reuben did, that's love. So he says, Beloved, whoever loves his brother and sister abides in the light. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother and sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. Because when we live by the fruit of the Spirit, we walk in the light. There's no stumbling anymore. He continues on. He, he gives this poem, this really neat poem that I invite you to read later on. But he continues on in verse number 15 and says this, do not love the world. Well, hold up. I thought you said you're, I'm supposed to love my brothers and sisters. See, this is one of those places where unless we trust in the word of God and God's wisdom and God's definition of things, as opposed to our individual or our group collective understanding, we're going to end up messing up. Because Jesus said in John chapter 17, as he's praying to the Father, that he's sending his disciples, that he loves them, and he's sending his disciples in the world, though they're not of the world. So he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eye and the pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God lives, abides forever. So we go back to Galatians chapter 5, where Paul's talking to the church in Galatia, where he says, here's the ways of the world, here's the ways of the flesh. It's all this list of sins. Don't do those because you, won't, you walk in the darkness because of it. You will not have eternal life. And then he says, here's the way of God. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And the very first one of them is love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul ends his whole chapter on love and saying that there, there are three that remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Because what we find out, even though we don't fully understand our stories like Joseph probably didn't, what we find out is that if we trust in the Lord, his ways are higher than our ways. His ways are better than our ways. It ends up leading towards better life. And it may not be, like in Joseph's case, you may not see it the whole entire time. You may be quite confused by it. I don't know about you, but like I said at the beginning, I'm glad I'm not in Joseph's shoes. That was probably a really hard life. But his life was blessed as a result of that. Because what Jesus says is God is not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living, which is why he is the father of Abraham Jacob, or Isaac and Jacob, which would also include Joseph. Because in Jesus, and what Bill was saying about the communion that we often so struggle about is that we have this promise of eternal life, of being in the eternal light and reflecting that glory, the glory of the one and only. And we know we're saved if we walk in the light as he is in the light. And we know that we're doing that if we love each other. So brothers and sisters, once again, I, I'll use me as an example. I don't want to use any, anybody. I'm not looking at anybody in particular right here. I know there's things I do that bug you. But I know there's parts of my personality that are just downright irritating to you. You want to know how I know that? I've looked in the mirror. <laughs> there's things about myself that just downright irritate me, where I go and go, I'm supposed to be a follower of Jesus. How in the world did I think, or how in the world did I do that? But God, because he is love in Jesus, looks at me and says, you are my child, whom is forgiven. And he does the same thing for each one of you. And because of that, as I work on loving myself, I work on loving you as well, because it's the greatest commandment to love the Lord our God with everything we are and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And what that does is it removes a love of the world, of the worldly things, and helps us to live by the Spirit. Though the world doesn't understand that definition of love, I promise you they don't, because look at the culture that's going on right now, or even the culture of the 60s, or even the culture of, I can go back year after year after year and show that the world never understands this. They'll try to redefine love. God's definition for love always works. It is always good. So let's work on loving each other. What I find really interesting about this 
is the very next thing that John writes about here in 1 John chapter 2. As he says, for there are many who have gone out and given false teachings, and they've declared other things about Jesus than are true. And he uses the word antichrist to talk about them. There are those who are not following Jesus and did not believe that he was God's flesh here on earth. And so we have a reason to seek his goodness because there is false teaching out there. John wrote that, by the way. Those of you that are scared of some antichrist coming in the future, that's not biblical. There's always been antichrist. John wrote that in the first century, talking about people who do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you walk in the light, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and have no reason to be in the darkness, is what he says in 1 John chapter 1. And so celebrate the truth that he is love, because love conquers fear. Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, who's working in Ephesus, ends up talking to him in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, and says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. The Holy Spirit gives us power, love, and self-discipline. It is the fruit of the Spirit. So let's love each other. Let's be confused about exactly what that means all the time, but let's seek what God's way is and what God's will is and realize that even when we're in the midst of a story that we're like, what in the world's going on? Like Joseph's story? That God is good all the time and that God is love and he is light. Let's trust him and follow him because without that trust and without that hope, I don't know about you, but I look at how the world tries to define things, and it seems incredibly confusing and backwards and broken and just horrible all the time. But God's ways always lead towards righteousness. They always lead to the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is a much better way to live, and it's a way of living to know that you are the child of God and that you are saved. One more time, I hope you all hear this, because when I was younger, I used to be so nervous if I was going to be saved or not. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe in him, you have eternal life. You're saved. It's that plain and simple. Don't agree with me? Look at the whole Gospel of John. That's what John's whole message is about, is that Jesus is the Savior. If you're not a follower of Jesus yet, what's holding you back from following him and being baptized? Don't, don't be scared. If you want to be baptized some other time where you don't have these 250 other people looking at you with all their weirdnesses and uh, personality quirks that might bug you, there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't get baptized some other time throughout the whole week. Follow Jesus in hope and faith. Because there are three that remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these three is love. For God so loved you, he sent his one and only son, that you may believe in him and have eternal life. And if you need prayer for anything, I ask you to come forward when we stand and sing in just a minute. And I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turns his face to you and gives you his peace.